And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe a man. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon and heap. And it came to pass, when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priest bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, and as they that bear the ark were come into Jordan... And the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city Adam, which is, that is, beside Zaratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho, and the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Joshua chapter 3, we continue on in our study and looking into Joshua's journey as he begins his leadership of the people of Israel at this time. And right away we catch another great trait of Joshua. Verse 1, in the beginning of that verse, it says, And Joshua rose early in the morning. Rose early in the morning. Is there any early risers here? <laughs> or do you prefer to sleep in? Because you're going to find, actually in the Scriptures and throughout the Scriptures, examples of great men of God having this same trait as being early risers to their day. We have Abraham rising early to meet with God. We have Jacob, or Israel also, rising early to meet with God. You can turn to Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8, keeping your finger in Joshua 3. Joshua, of course, learned from Moses how to rise up early. We'll follow through a few examples. But Moses learned it from God Almighty. If you look in chapter 8 of Exodus, and in verse 20... It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Over in Exodus chapter 9, in verse 13, again we have, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. 
Over in Exodus chapter 24, we've seen now the pattern of God calling Moses to get up in the morning and go to your day. Here Moses' day was to stand before the king, stand before Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. In Exodus chapter 24, look with me in verse 4. It says, and Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and builded an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. So here we find Moses arising up now of his own accord to write the words of the Lord and to build an altar and these 12 pillars according to each of the tribes of Israel. So Moses had learned early on in his ministry by the prompting of God to get up early. Now of his own accord, he's doing the same. He's getting up early and getting to work. Look over in Exodus chapter 34 in one more place. Exodus chapter 34. <clears throat> Exodus 34, and verse 4, the Bible reads, Exodus 34 and verse 4, And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning, and went up unto Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth, and worship. Here, Moses is receiving of the word of God on those two tables of stone, yes, but he's also hearing God stand before him and proclaim his own name, the Lord, the Lord God. Now, traits about him, he's learning of God, he's, he's, he's growing in the knowledge of our Savior as God calls himself merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and so on, keeping mercy, forgiving iniquity, no, my, no means clearing the iniquity of the children and the fathers as, and the generations generations to come Moses learning all these things about God as he rises up early to meet with God Moses made haste bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped the Lord there early in the morning so sometimes that might be the only place where we really get quiet we really get peace we really get opportunity to meet with God before the busyness of the household rise up before your job starts filling your mind with the, the tasks of the day and before life starts catching up with you there early in the morning you can meet with God and there you can worship and praise God and there you can receive of his word and there you can grow in his knowledge there early in the morning and I believe that this was passed on yes learned of Abraham learned by studying Jacob in his life learned from Moses and his example but taught by God Almighty that we ought to start early and we ought to start our day with God. Back in Joshua, Joshua's life, of course, was no different. As he had learned from Moses, so Joshua chapter 3 and verse 1, Joshua rose early in the morning. In the second part of that verse, it says, And they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. There, Shittim is of the fame of Numbers chapter 25. If you remember, that's where the people Israel create, caused or were caused to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And this great event was brought to remembrance in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 as an example that we should not follow. He says, they fell a whoring with these daughters of Israel and fell in that day thousands of people and these things were written for our example upon whom the ends of the world are come, that we ought not do these things. You can go and study that yourself. Numbers chapter 25, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 8 actually mentions this same place, Shittim. It's this place of fornication with the daughters of Moab. And it's another place that Israel was brought to where they had to overcome something that they had failed in before. Of course, we read previous of the event um, of Rahab, receiving spies 
Well, Joshua was probably a little nervous sending spies again, concerned that Israel would come back with that negative report of the land, and therefore they would, they would be singing against God in their unbelief and spend more time out in the wilderness. He might have also worried about bringing the people to Shittim, that place where Moab had access to them, where the daughters were able to seduce the children of Israel, and that great whoredom had taken place, and all of these people died. He brought them again to that same place, and I think he might have had some concerns that the people would fall for the same fornication, but it seems they had passed this test the second time around, and therefore it did not overcome them. They stayed in Shittim, came to Jordan and lodged there outside of that town of Shittim near the brink of Jordan, waiting there before they were to pass over. One thing we should learn from that is if you're ever given a second chance at something, and sometimes this is how the Christian life works, God gives you a job to do, and you're expected and supposed to pass the test and, and succeed that first time, but for whatever reason, unbelief, doubt, um, just, just your own weakness, whatever it is, you fail in that area. Do you know what God will sometimes do? He'll take you through a wilderness where he marches you around that mount again and then brings you back to the same challenge. And he does that so that in that time you can reflect, you can meditate, you can grow in grace and the knowledge of your Lord and Savior and come back to that same event, that same decision, and hopefully the second time around you will not make that same mistake. We see that two times in Joshua's ministry, in the beginning of his ministry, that the people were brought to a challenge again and they passed the test. They passed the challenge. So... If you're given a second chance in your life, learn from the mistakes that you have made because you might face those same challenges again in your life. And don't repeat it. We're continuing on in Joshua. Look at verse 2. It says, And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. And they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. <clears throat> so this is not some new thing to the people of Israel. If you can, you can go to Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10. And this is just a specific example of, of what I mean. Moses is commanding, when ye see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and the priests bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. <clears throat> Numbers chapter 10, there at the end of the chapter in verse 35, we basically have a description of the wanderings in the wilderness. It says in verse 35 of Numbers chapter 10, And it came to pass, when the Ark set forward, that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. And so he made that proclamation every time the, the ark was lifted or set down. And when the people saw the ark lifted or set down, they were to do the same. Get up, get going, or sit down and rest a while in that place. Back in Joshua chapter 3. So... <clears throat> This command was no different to them. This was no surprise to them. They had seen it many times that as the ark moved, so they moved. This ark was, of course, a place of sacrifice. It was a place where God would meet with his people. It was also a place where there was command to journey or to rest. In other words, the ark was the presence of God. It was the, the picture of the emblem of, the type of the presence of God. And they went there for sacrifice to God. They went there to meet with God. They went there to receive guidance for their journeys that were ahead. And this is exactly what transpired and took place here. He commands them as they had heard many times, the ark raises, we're going to get going. It's time to rise from your place and go after it. <clears throat> Verse 4, it says, yet, okay, so here's a little bit of a difference that he's going to give in regard to that command. He said, yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. So because you have not been this way, because you have not passed this way heretofore, you've never crossed the Jordan in this area, keep space. Give about 2,000 cubits, he says. So 2,000 of here to here, 18 inches. Give that much space that you may know the way. 
In other words, don't get ahead of God. Keep a distance. Don't be presumptuous. You have not been here before. Let God lead is what he's telling the people. Give God some space to move on before you, before you follow after him. One thing that I noticed that is kind of interesting about this verse, and this is completely an aside, is that he says that there's going to be a difference of 2,000 cubits by measure from the ark to the people. And it's just interesting to me that I'm now standing here about 2,000 years from when the ark was last used there in Israel. Jesus having put all of that aside when he finally came to this earth and was that final sinless sacrifice. It's just an interesting thing that I've noticed. There's about 2,000 uh, years of space between me and God using that ark before. And so... <clears throat> We continue on, and there is that space granted so that the people, not knowing where to go, could know the way by letting God lead on before them a certain distance. He says in verse 5 then, after giving them that instruction to follow the ark at a distance, verse 5 it says, And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And the thing that grabs me immediately is, what if we just acted like this all the time? <laughs> Sanctify yourselves, trusting that tomorrow God is going to do great wonders before you. God is going to do great things before you. What if we believed like this every single night before we went to bed, that tomorrow is going to be a day that God is going to do wonders among me? And the reality is, is that he does wonders among us every day. It's just sometimes we just don't see it. Because we don't take the time to care and to acknowledge God and everything that goes on in our lives. And so we're missing wonders. We're missing miracles. We're missing amazing things that God has been doing in our lives. Maybe that's a verse that we ought to commit to our memory. Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among you. Sanctify yourself as you prepare for bed. Set yourself apart in a special way because you're expecting God to do great things in your life on the next day. What he's saying here is we sanctify at night. And what we learned from the beginning of the chapter is we rise up early expecting great things from God. And that should be a great pattern for us to just grab, even if we only had one thing to take from the chapter so far, and one thing to take from the message so far. Sanctify yourself at night. Get up early expecting that God will do wonders among you. And you'll be amazed what that will do. That, that's like finishing your night and starting your next day with that attitude of in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. That's the spirit of that proverb. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Sanctify yourself at night expecting that when you get up early he's going to do wonders among you. <clears throat> so he begins to then give instruction to the people there in verse 5. Sanctify yourselves, be prepared for wonders to take place. Next in verse 6, it says, And Joshua spake unto the priests. So he's turned his attention from the people to the priests, and he's going to instruct them. Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And then if we were to look back into Verse 3, we would see that the people were charged that they were to see the priest bearing it, remove from their place, and get ready to go after it. And so, somewhere in this, sanctification has taken place, arrest through the night has taken place, and then they're rising up and they're about to take their journey. In verse 7, we see Joshua, after having sanctified himself, because I don't think he's the type to command his people to do one thing and not do it himself, He's sanctified himself, and now God in that time frame has come and meet with him there in verse 7. It says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, Ye shall stand still in Jordan. So here a sanctified Joshua, I believe, woke up early and received this instruction, this message from God. And you notice it says, 
this day in verse 7 it says this day will i begin to magnify you in the sight of these people so he's up he meets with god slightly before i think the people he comes then with a word from god to the people in the very next verse so again we're looking at a time frame that's happening and these verses are a little bit interlaced as you read it but at some point joshua was saying but at some point god spoke to him and now he's bringing that same message to all the people of israel in verse 9 it says and joshua said unto the children of israel come near and hear and joshua said unto the children of israel come hither and hear the words of the lord your god so notice something here in the beginning of verse 10, it says, And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you. And then he lists this group of people. So he gathers the people together to hear the words of this living God. They've known him. They've interacted with him. He's been among them all this time. But here's another revelation of his word to them. It's amazing to me, though, to see that God said there in verse 7 that he was going to begin to magnify Joshua. Joshua rose up and said, get ready, people. God's about to magnify himself. And so while God seeks to magnify his man, his man is just pointing back to God and saying, get ready because he's about to glorify and magnify himself. Verse 10, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you. Hereby it will be clear that God is here and present and ready to do the work that he has promised he would do. God is about to magnify himself, and God is saying, I'm only doing it that I might magnify you, Joshua, in their sight, as his man, as his leader to the people at this time. But you see where Joshua's heart is, always trying to give God the glory. It says in verse 10 that he will without fail drive out before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites, all those ites, all those people that were in that land, those ones that were to be expelled from the land without mercy and without fail. Verse 11, it says, Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. So people, God is about to Make known that he is among you. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant passeth over before you into this great Jordan. And they might ask themselves at this time, into Jordan? Go to Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah chapter 12 to the right in your Bible. Into Jordan, into Jordan. But don't they know that the Jordan is this strong and raging river? Don't they know that standing even on the brink of Jordan, Jeremiah 12, is a risky thing at this time. Here's another opportunity where doubt could come in. A favorite verse of Jeremiah chapter 12 came to mind as I was, as I was reflecting on this and thinking about the River Jordan, the River Jordan. <clears throat> and it shows you how great God is and how he is about to magnify himself, prove to himself in the example of his stopping of the Jordan River to basically justify and prove that he can do whatever challenge is facing them in the promised land. Jeremiah 12 and verse 5, it says, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, how canst thou contend with the horses? In other words, if you're running with men, and you're tired, and you're exhausted, and you can't keep up, or you weary yourself to keep up, then how are you going to contend with horses? It's amazing because horses are something that men can outrun, but it takes training, it takes diligence, it takes perseverance, it takes endurance and growing in endurance in order to get to that point. Now it continues on in verse 5 and it says, And if the in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, in other words, when it's peaceful, you're trusting, you're, you're trusting God, you're believing God, you're, you're, you're confident. If in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, and how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? The swelling of Jordan is likened unto the exact polar opposite of peace. 
When Jordan's swelling, it's, it's tempestuous, it's, it's turmoil, it's rushing, it's powerful, it's strong opposition to the work that you are doing. It's like contending with horses when you can barely run with footmen. That's how the swelling of Jordan and, and the impossible measure of its opposition can be. Back in Joshua chapter 3, in Joshua chapter 3, Jordan, what they're about to enter into is the exact opposite of a peaceful situation. As great of a miracle as it was for them to cross the Red Sea upon dry land, so much more is this miracle of crossing Jordan. Sometimes it gets overlooked. It doesn't get all the fame. It doesn't get all the, the glory and the infamy when we think about great water crossings. But this Jordan was far more powerful of a flow. It was far more tempestuous, especially at this time. We also have to consider that there's many more people now crossing that river than had previously experienced the crossing of the Red Sea way back in antiquity, it now must seem to these people. So this is at least as great of a miracle as the Red Sea crossing. And so God here is going to glorify his man, Joshua, and at the same time receive glory unto himself by doing this great and wonderful miracle before the people. Verse 12 of Joshua chapter 3, he had just finished saying, Behold, the Ark of the Covenant passeth over before you into Jordan, Verse 12, it says, Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe a man. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon the and heap. Now I love this because this is another picture that you can use as a as an example for salvation, as an example for sanctification and how God works through his people. He says as soon as the soles of the feet that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest. As soon as their feet shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down. In other words, as soon as men take their rest, God starts to work his miracle. As soon as they stop pressing forward, as soon as they stop laboring, as soon as they stop doing works and stand and rest, that's when God starts to work. And that's the same promise that we have. And so often we want to, to we know that salvation is by grace through faith, not of works. And we're all settled on that. But then we take that into our ministry and into our lives and into our families. We kind of just pass that little tidbit about the workings of God by. God wants us to rest ultimately when it comes to him working. Why? Because he's going to get all the glory there. But God's not selfish in receiving glory. Look what he's done with Joshua. He says, Joshua, I'm going to glorify thee before these people. And then they'll know to follow thee even as they have followed Moses all of these years. Joshua says, well, you're going to receive great glory, God. And of course, God knows that. And so he does this great and notable miracle only once people stopped trying and moving and pressing on. They simply stepped out in faith and rested in the waters. And God did his work in that moment. As soon as their feet had rest, God cuts off the things that troubled him. That's what I see here. As soon as they stopped trying to press through the turmoil and the tempestuous of the waters that was in front of them. As soon as they gave up and rested, that's when God started to cut off the troubles before them and do his great and notable work. Now, at the beginning of verse 14, he's just described everything he's going to do. Now the men step forward, the soles of their feet are planted there. Now the Lord of all the earth is going to do what he does best. And verse 14, in the first five words there, some of my favorite words in the whole entire Bible. And it came to pass. But God just promised them everything that he was going to do in their life, in their days, in the moment that they were living in. And it came to pass. And it came to pass. When the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, 
And as they that bear the ark were come into Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for the Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city of Adam that is beside Zaratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed and were cut off. Look, God did abundantly above all that he even said. He said he would cut off those that came down, but now he's also cutting off those that came in from the salt sea in the plain. He said when they failed and were cut off and the people passed right over against Jericho without effort, easy once they had done what God had said. In verse 17 it says, And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. And so I love that phrase too. They passed over clean. They passed clean over Jordan. I think there's a dual meaning. Completely over Jordan is when they all passed and where they all passed. But they were also clean because there would be no mud. There would be no dirt. There would be nothing to kick up and to soil them because God makes it clear that dry ground is what they passed by on and they stood firm and were able to stand firm on that very dry ground. Why? Because God said so and it came to pass. God promised and it came to pass. And take any one of these promises of the scriptures, Old and New Testament. If God says it and it applies to you, God promises and it came to pass. You'll always see God work in that way if we are doing the things that he would expect us to do. And that's exactly what you see from the people of Israel. Look, Joshua gets up early in the morning. He hears the commands of God. He follows through with dictating them to the people in order. People, sanctify yourselves. Priests, be prepared to go. He receives more commands from God. He brings those to them. Then he brings everybody together, commands the priests to move forward. The people follow in afterwards. And as soon as the Ark of the Covenant and those priests come and they stand still, they fulfilled everything they need to do on the side uh, of the people in appeasing God. And God just steps in and does his work. The same is true in our lives. It gets to a point where you're obeying God and you're obeying God and you're obeying God and maybe sometimes you get frustrated because you're not seeing Him work. Well, just wait. Take your rest. Do whatever you can in as far as your ministry, as far as your family, as far as the troubles that you have. Step in even to the brink of the troubled water that is rushing through your life. Stand there, rest there, and then just wait for God to do what He promised. And God's promised so many things in the scriptures. I don't need to belabor the points. You can pick up books that are simply called Blessed Promises of Scriptures. I know one time my wife was really struggling. and She just had this book that was just full of promise after promise after promise. I will not leave thee nor forsake thee. I, God promises to provide, you know, clothes and food and raiment. All of these great promises that God has made, He certainly will fulfill them. Maybe what's missing on your part, after all that you have done, after all that you have labored, after all that you have carried that ark to, the point where you can carry it no farther for the trouble that's before you, is all that's needed is to stand and rest and behold and see the salvation of God Almighty. And that's what you see in the lives of Joshua and the people here. They face challenges that they'd seen before. They've overcome them because of the things that they have learned. And now God brings them to the brink of another challenge. And he says, watch, I'm about to sanctify you, Joshua. I'm about to show you to be the leader that I have chosen. I'm about to magnify thee. And Joshua says, uh-uh, just wait, people. God's about to magnify himself, and surely he does that. And it's a wonderful story, and I love hearing the book of Joshua and the way that this has, has unfolded. Remember, if there's a few things we can learn, sanctify yourself at night and prepare to rise early in the morning and have God do great things among you. And if you have that attitude of expectancy and then you rest in that, God certainly will bring it to pass whatsoever he has promised to do in your life. You can trust that. You can bank that. You can, you can just believe that God will do great exploits in your life. I'm so thankful, God, for all